Welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. I am your host, Byron Pace. It is the 11th of June, 2020, and this podcast is made possible with the support of our partner, Modern Huntsman. On this show, I sit down with Merlin Becker, who at the time when I recorded this was in his final days working for the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. He has since moved back to Ireland to work on other conservation projects there. I travelled up to the GWCT model farm where he worked, which is just north of where I live in Scotland, to discuss the work being done there on land management research. It was a very snowy February morning, but so worth the incredibly slow journey there and back uh, with a lot of snow falling all around me and very, very slippy roads. We tackle such a wide spectrum of topics in this conversation, from the Otterburn Research Project to the use of fire for ecological management, uh, where traditional knowledge meets science, the new hair counting methodology, curlew conservation, raven control, and I also get to tuck into an excellent homemade goose burger. And Merlin gave me a handful to take home with me as well. So the bar has definitely been raised when it comes to interviewing podcast guests. I'm also expecting to be fed and have self procured meat to take home with me. A couple of things before we dive in. Modern Huntsman Volume 5 is on its way to the printers as I record this. So head over to modernhuntsman.com to get your pre-order now. If you're outside of North America, visit thepacebrothers.com and you'll be able to get your copy there. For the competition two weeks back, I asked you to share the podcast on Instagram and the winner picked at random is Ali Hill, who incidentally I think shares the podcast on Instagram every time he listens and is normally in a tractor. So when you hear this, Ali, you're probably in a tractor doing some farming activity, finding out that you've just won a copy of Modern Huntsman. So uh, give us a shout and I will get whatever copy you want out to you. Once again, you all now have the chance to win your own copy of Modern Huntsman. And for this show, it will be a rate and or review on whatever podcast platform you listen to this on. Uh, there's normally a way to rate or review the show. I will pick a winner from anybody who rates or reviews between now and when the next long form podcast comes out in two weeks time. Also, just as a side thought, let me know what you think of the new short shows that come out in between these. Do you like them? Do you not? Tell me what you think. As always, a massive thanks to our Patreon supporters. If you want to help make these shows, head over to patreon.com forward slash Pace Brothers and you can pick a support tier. In the top tier this month, we have Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of rdcontracting.co.uk, Tom McCraith, James Benjamin, Normandale, James Marchington, the guys at South Asher Stalking, who just bought a whole bunch of podcast t-shirts, so thank you very much, guys. Uh, Josh Starling, Sean Rowan, James Alvin Corbin, Thomas Cameron, and Mark Zabrowski. And with that, I think that's enough for me. Let's get into this incredible conversation with Merlin Becker. Merlin, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. We're sitting in your lounge in a very snowy Scotland. I'm slightly afraid that I'm not going to be able to get home oh, <laughs> because crash. I nearly didn't get here in the first place. <laughs> and that slight roar that people might be able to hear in the background is your fire. And you have just fed me goose burgers and duck eggs. Well, the standard has to be high for all podcasts wow. as we go forward. I, so. You have just raised the freaking <laughs> bar. That's what I expect every time I go visit somebody to do a podcast now. Excellent. The fruits of the land, nothing better. Tell me where we are, because this place, this, um, do you call it a farm? Yeah, demo farm, yeah. Okay, so this demo farm is very unique and it's a very interesting place. It's situated in the, the highlands of Scotland, not all that far from Dinnet. Uh, you took me for a drive. I didn't get to see that much of it because it's all covered in a blanket of snow, <laughs> uh, but you pointed out a few things to me. Tell me what this place is and how it came into existence. Yeah, so basically we are sitting in um, an area called the Howe Cromar. Um, we are in um, Aberdeenshire, um, Royal D side. So this is um, just outside of Boyne, for some of you who may, who may know it. Um, and um, so, yeah, it's the, the name of the farm is Ochnaren Farm, um, or the official title is the Game and Wildlife Scottish Demonstration Farm. 
that has been run by the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust here in Scotland. Um, and we have taken on the farm, or well, we took the farm on five years um, ago, and with the vision to basically demonstrate best practice um, agriculture as well as best practice game management, and then obviously being a research-based organisation, um, trying to link in that sort of a three-pronged attack, if you will. Um, and as I spoke to you about earlier, <coughs> um, when we first, well, before we took the farm on, we asked the question on a number of organisations, the JHI, SRUC, etc., who, who have... James, the James Hutton Institute. Uh, yeah, the yeah. James Hutton Institute, sorry. Um, of if, um, will there, is there a real need for a demonstration farm of this calibre? Um, and basically said very much so there is. Um, there's been some great demonstration farms across Scotland that do research excellently well or do farming excellently well and demonstrate, demonstrate the best of each. But there's actually nothing in Scotland that actually links in the sporting element. And um, we, GWCT, are uniquely placed in that regard. Um, very lucky working with a lot of sporting estates and the uh, and the game management sector as a whole um through our, our 80 plus years of research um and so yeah we have the, the foundation of a, a research project going on here um a hill edge farm um and then the the shoot uh, we have a, very lucky enough to have a wild bird shoot here that i run and that sort of linked in the the, the demonstration side of things so it's that three-pronged um sort of um, um foundation of work um, and it's a very very exciting project. We've um, we haven't had a haven't had it easy the first few years, or to say, to say to say the least. Um, but basically, what we're what the overall aim is of the farm is basically to showcase to government, to other NGOs, to other individuals, anybody, any walk of life, really. Um, basically, showing them what you can achieve um, with a healthy um wildlife population alongside a profitable modern farm um and actually prove that it's possible to do that so this is about efficient land use for the good of wildlife and people as well yeah very much because so yeah people need to be able to live off the land and yeah, make a living definitely. and things need to be profitable and economic otherwise they get used for another another resource as a another resource or another purpose i should mention before it's a, it's a hill edge unit um, so we're 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 running probably around 1,100 uh, Scottish black-faced sheep here at the moment. We're looking to get that number up to around 1,500 to make it economically viable. Um, and then one of the the um, the main sort of drivers behind this farm is using our um, sheep flock to graze the mountain behind us here. And this is Dinnet Dinnet Grouse Moor, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, and they're acting as a important. Um, important machine for um, controlling habitat, you know, grazing throughout the so year. How do, they, how do they actually do that? Because a lot of people think, or I think maybe the general notion is, you know, sheep, domestic livestock, it's just there to consume, to put weight on, to go to the abattoir to get in my belly because I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do like lamb. Um, but they actually have a management function as well, which I think is probably not that well understood. Or they, sorry, I should say they can have a management function. Yeah, yeah. Um, sheep are an amazing um, environmental engineer, if you will. They really have shaped Scotland's landscape and many, many landscapes, both Ireland, Scotland and, and England and Wales. For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, it's why we mainly have this beautiful landscape that we all love, um, the heather hills, the heathery clad hills. Um, but as you said, you, you, they can be a good a force for good, but then at the same time, you know, they can be a force for, for some negative, negative it, aspects for overgrazing. Yeah, I was going to say, like, we've seen a lot of evidence, uh, or we realise what is now overgrazing mm. and possibly, like, the, the abuse of our natural habitats yeah. for sheep from, like, back in the sort of... 60s, 70s, yeah, the production no. sort of era, yeah. yeah. Um, so really, it's it's a, a, a multifaceted approach, really, of of actually producing not just an animal for meat, but you're also um, producing a, a whole suite of environmental benefits for um, for the mountain, for 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 heather, for example, keeping that in a in a good fit state, um, you know, and, and keeping the the encroachment of um, um, scrub habitat, if you will, down. But that obviously brings us into a whole the realm of you know out, open landscape versus you know the 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 tree landscape or the, the which is forestry a, plans which is through. a debate that's very hot yeah, and on the agenda exactly right now. yeah yeah and again there has to be a place for everything you know and I'm a strong believer of the right thing in the right place um, but me being a bit of a, a heather fanatic and, a, and an open landscape fanatic and, a, and very passionate about grouse um, I find it should be really protected and uh, and celebrated because it's you know Ireland and the UK has approximately 80% of the world's heather habitat and it's 
it's a very, very, very unique, unique uh, ecosystem. Um, I, I, I'm torn as to where to take the, take this discussion because there's so many <laughs> things I want to ask you. We, we have a, barely scratched the surface of what you have been doing here for the last couple of years on Demonstration Farm, and I feel like that's something I sh we should return to. Yeah, because yeah. We're, we're, we've got on to Heather now. Yeah, yeah. And I've just been to a place in Ireland. Uh, that I know that you've been to, and mm. they spoke very fondly of you, yeah. uh, which is looking at this amazing restoration of the landscape mm. where they seem to have what would seem counterintuitive to the discussion that we're having in Scotland right now, where we're uh, wanting to sort of rewild and retree a lot of our upland areas. Whereas there, they were cutting forests down and pulling trees out of the moor. What do we understand about our moorland habitat? Because as you said, we have most, in Scotland as a country, UK as a whole, but Scotland as a country, we have more of it in Scotland than anywhere else in the world. Is it important? Why do we care? Um, that's a very, very good question. And there was a very uh, interesting um, set of uh, conferences set up by the Heather Trust a number last year, a few roadshows, and basically saying, um, you know, what are what are Scotland or what are the UK uplands for? And I think it means the uplands of, of any environment in the UK and Ireland means so many different things to so many different people. Um, but certainly for linked in with my job, I um, should have said I, I work as a, a training advisor with the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. Uh, and part of my role is um, um, working with land managers, mainly keepers and, and estate owners and farmers as well. Um, and basically looking to see how we can better ourselves, how we can improve the natural environment. And I find personally, from what I've my experience of working in Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England, um, the areas that the Heather Moorland that we love today are actually, these are the, probably the, one of the least disturbed areas of ground that are actually at, on these islands. You know, the plough hasn't reached there yet, the sprays haven't reached there yet. Mm. And, and, and where I'm, they have, there's now, they're now grass fields and sheep grazing. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm saying, don't get me wrong, there, 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 there still needs to be a need for production of food. I'm not, I'm not arguing in that case. And that has to be very clearly understood and clearly worked towards. We can't forget but about that. it can that. be, we can probably, well, I mean, that's kind of what you're doing here, doing yeah. in a more sympathetic manner. Exactly, landscape. yeah, yeah. But the whole holistic approach approach to it, to, to it all. And certainly as a hill edge unit as this, this this as an agricultural output is actually one of the probably most environmentally friendly net carbon, whatever you want to tag it as, type of farming that you can ever get, you know. And we have, we're working on probably around 1,200 acres at the moment and we're grazing 1,100 to, to 1,500 sheep. Um, but the amount of wildlife we have here is just absolutely astonishing. You know, we have um, last year, 2019, we had um, 75 breeding pair of lapwing on the farm. We had approximately around 10 to 12 um, breeding pair of curlew. And around 25. Curlew is quite possibly my favourite bird in the UK. They are absolutely wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful bird and something that we need to work harder at so and how many did you say up. you had here about around 10 to 12 pair i think and how many how, how many fledged um, how many nests fledged? that's a very good question i think we had a bit it was a bit of a it was a bit of a funny old year for curly last year um um, but probably the the exact numbers of fledging, I think we probably had around six or seven that fledged i think there was a number of issues we had actually some um some juvenile packs of carrion crow come in very unexpectedly. Raid um, nests. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And we find here as well that we're not too bad with carrion crow here, but we actually find rook and jackdaw do have a do have a negative impact on some of the nests. Um, and we're something where again we're trying to feed into, you know, building up a scientific evidence based um, to show that you know these these corvids can cause a, a negative impact on these on these very very threatened birds. Um, so bringing it back to the uh, farm overall, it's it's a, an amazing haven. But really, the, the the crux of why that really is like it is today is basically a farming system. Before we took the farm on five years ago, it hadn't really been hard farmed for a good 15, 20 years. So you're having a combination of low input agriculture coupled with very high standard level of predator control. And this is um, uh, instigated by the, 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 the keeping team in and around the farm here the grouse more behind us and then sort of surrounding uh, surrounding countryside as well so it's it's a very well keepered area very well well managed area and then so you have that that coupling of, of two um uh, management techniques and it's just uh, wildlife is just absolutely abounded with it it's fantastic am amount of wildlife here just explain uh predator control uh, and what that can entail yeah, so basically the 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 level of pedicure that's carried out on the farm here is is undertaken by um as I said some of the some of the grouse keepers and some of the professional game keepers um 
And their main target is um, your foxes, your carrion crow, uh, your mustelids, so your stoats, your weasels, and then also your rats as well. So they're sort of the main, they're the main sort of bulk of the of the predators that are that are that are that are controlled. Um, and then I am very lucky that I was able to step in as well and lend a wee hand. Uh, and my efforts were mainly focused on on corvid corvid control, um, and as I said, jo- j- jackdaws and rooks were the main targets for for us over the last um, four years that I've been here. And basically, what you're trying, I always explain, predator control is a little evil for a greater good, especially nowadays when you know in the public eye of of of, of animals getting killed. You know, it's it's a very difficult thing to to digest. You know, if you're not from the countryside or from the countryside or you know, you've never been around this side of things or if, if, if you don't know, know a hell of a lot about it. Uh, and I think we all have a duty to ourselves as well as our the whole environmental sector is actually to get a bit more of a proactive me- message out about it. Um, and again, little evil for a greater good. And, and for example, you know, you, if you control one fox, um, but that actually allows for two curlew and maybe five lapwing to fledge young you know the lapwing and a curlew these are a, 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 in our country anyway they're a, a threatened species you know red listed species yeah i think Certainly curlew is the, curlew, the most endangered bird the, in the uk yeah it's the highest yeah. conservation yeah. concern bird in the uk at the moment uh, and for good reason you know there's believed to be less than 300 pair of curlew south of the line of birmingham in england and then in ireland now is believed to be 150 um or if if not less in my eyes um breeding pair of curlew left in the republic of ireland and this is this is really really dire dire straits it's such you know? a small core population to yeah. move forward with yeah and they're such a long-lived bird you see so mm. <coughs> it's one of the issues you know they i can didn't realize that so how long do they how long do they uh, it varies but they can live up to around 20 30 years potentially oh, right. yeah, okay. yeah again obviously there's a lot of variances yeah. in there um, but they are a very long-lived bird, <coughs> um, and that's one of the issues that we're finding now. Is that actually a lot of these birds are going down on nests, but it's the productivity is the key. They're raising chicks, and the chicks are just generally getting hammered by. It's not just predators, but obviously modern farming practices as well. The silage silage element that can play into a, in, into a part, but certainly predation is a thing that we can really help with in the short term to help a lot of these species get a chance, get up to a population uh, and get a chance really just to survive. So yeah, it's one thing saying, yeah, we had X number of curlew nesting, but yeah, that it's kind of irrelevant if nothing fledges. Yeah, exactly. What do we know about um, curlew survival in terms of fledging and the, the biggest impacts that we could, I mean, you've kind of alluded to it there through predator control. I know there's been a lot of very rigorous scientific research by a number of bodies particularly with regard to um fox control mm. on curlews and the importance of it yeah I mean, so they, they do you can correct me correct me if i'm wrong but my understanding and the, what is generally accepted is that they they do best on managed moorland which is the habitat that they like to nest in we can talk about why the habitat's like that in terms of management but predominantly their success rate is due to the reduced density of predators in those areas yeah very much so and this is a this is a bit of work that GWCT really was a was a, a, a world leader, and I'd probably argue um, it was the Otterburn predation experiment um, in Northumberland. Um, and I always remember that scientific paper was published in 2009, I think it was, or t- I think it was 2009 or 2010. Anyway, I, I distinctly remember it in, u- in university. And it was one of the first bits of scientific evidence that the RSPB agreed that predator control was a viable management tool. Yeah. And we highlighted it, we framed it in the house, and we were so <laughs> proud. And it's like, yes, this is the starting, this is the start to make make a bit of progress on, on both sides of the argument. Um, and um, But from that experiment, that predation experiment, it was um, uh, fully funded by the GWCT. Um, it took, um, it was nine years worth of a, of a study. Uh, and it basically... Um, being a research-based organization, we love to play around with the experiments of taking, instilling one management and removing it and changing it around. So basically yeah. they had... Um, so you're testing the variable. Exactly, yeah. So we basically had four different variables. So we had one site that had predator control for the full nine year. We had one site with um, no predator control for the whole nine year. And then we had two sites with basically predator control for the first four year four and a bit year and then um switched it around and then vice versa did that with all uh, the, the two alternating sites so again getting a really good picture over a really quite a long time frame you know this was you know nine odd year um 
over um, with full time gamekeepers. So you know, have head keeper with with three or four guys underneath them. So you know, the cost of that, you know, I'm not, not sure the exact cost of it, but it was in and around three million pounds. You know, over that, you know, so a lot of money. Um, but again, highlighting that predator control as a management tool is fantastic for ground nesting birds. And particularly this um, study was looking into curlew, golden plover, lapwing and black grouse. And there's a whole other suite of other species, but that was yeah, sort of the main, that was the, the, the main crux ones. of it. Yeah. And from this, this scientific study, um, they, um, they, 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 they showed there's some fantastic data online, the GWCT website, if any of those, any of those interested in learning a bit more about it, basically curlew, fledging success is what we measure the the sort of the 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 ability to recruit into the population and you know how how well it does because you can obviously have figures of um pears yeah eggs nests but it doesn't mean a whole world of rubbish <laughs> if, it, if they're not actually getting young away you yeah. know so fledging success was three times higher in areas carried out predator control versus areas that were not carrying out predator control um, and to you and I, you know, very passionate hunters, shooters, fishers, that's very basic sort of um, um, language. But yeah, <coughs> to the other, something that's been undertaken for a very long time, even if it m- maybe wasn't fully understood in terms of like the numbers and the stats. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was the first sort of um, really hard, um, hard evidence based study to bring this out to the fore and uh, you know the gamekeeping fraternity and the game management sector have been saying this for years a hell of a lot longer than that but that was one of the first baseline um, studies for us to, to do that and that has been used in the Grouse Westminster debate it's been used uh, countless times at Holyrood to show that you know one once best practice game management is instigated by an estate or a land holding or a farm it can be a really good force for good rather than the the, the other side of the coin where it can be vilified because you know the animal rights people aren't so agree agreeable about the the whole well, they issue don't like, of yeah, they have something having to die for something exactly to live. yeah yeah so yeah. W- with regard to that question then are we is it that uh, we are picking we're cherry picking these species the curly black grouse and the control of predators is then at the detriment of those populations of predators like how do you how do you square and explain that to your general public. Yeah, it's 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 a very difficult question. It's one that we get. But all, there's plenty of corvids and there's yeah. plenty of foxes. Well, that's that's one of the that's yeah. one of the things, and that's one of the that's one of the the indicators what SNH will always look at of a control of a species. If you're ever going to be threatening the conservation status of any species, it's not going to be allowed. And the conservation status of fox and corvid numbers have been they've been pretty stable, if not increasing, for many, many moons now. Um, so, and again, back to that point I mentioned earlier, you know, you're little evil for a greater good. I would argue that a fox population can, in a certain area, can take a level of control to reduce them down to a certain level to get things that are red-listed and are that are, you know, these species can go extinct, will be going extinct in both in our lifetimes. We're, <laughs> we're looking at yeah, that result at, right yeah. now. Unless we, uh, there's a lot being done, but I, mm. I don't, it's not enough yet. No, and, and unfortunately not. And I think there's a lot of there's there was a great um, I don't know if you saw that that uh, fantastic guy uh, over in Australia about the wildfires mm-hmm. talking about the burning in 360 degrees. Okay. Um, I can I can put a link into your I've inc- I've incorporated this into our Neuro Muir Burn course um, oh, training. We're, we're going to talk about Muir Burn in a minute, which yeah. is which is very good. But anyway, this guy from Australia, he uh, teaches traditional burning methods. And they burn within a 360 degrees, so all the animals can escape. You know, cool burning, and this is burning in you know in Australia. You know, it's pretty hot. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and it, uh, <laughs> not not in all places, but you know you know what I mean. Um, but anyway, he put he banged the nail perfectly on the head. What he's saying about the Australian Australian people, Australian government, everybody's confused. There's a fire for conservation. There's a fire for hazard control. There's a fire for great for grazing. Like, there's all these different buzzwords and different organizations wanting to do different things and there's actually no joint up way of thinking of actually hold on here for a minute guys the guys who are doing this for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years knew knew what they were doing yeah. you know and it's not rocket science you know controlling using fire as man has done for thousands of years to control fire and to control these devastating um 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 events that happen yeah um, just by controlling fuel loads exactly yeah yeah and uh, i think that's very pertinent in today's modern society here in the uk in our conservation sector you know and, and it's linkable to ireland as well that i've seen you know we're, we're all trying to achieve the same thing here 
but I think which if is we all, greater greater biodiversity. Yeah, exactly. We all love wildlife, you know, yeah. and we all want to protect it. But uh, I think if we, uh, we had a great chat about our staff conference two years ago, which I was t- telling you earlier on about the, um, you know, if, if we did more social science in our in our day to day work in any line of work, nearly not just the wildlife sector. I think we'd probably would be achieving a hell of a lot more. Yeah, I, it's, well, I've brought it up a few times. But I think we forget when we're talking about conservation that we think it's only about wildlife. Yeah, yeah. But actually, <laughs> conservation has to involve people because yeah. we've touched everything. Definitely, yeah, on especially the on these on this landscape. Yeah, as I mean, well. we yeah, live yeah, on a tiny, especially here. We live in a tiny island. But even you look at North America. I mean, there's vast yeah. areas where it doesn't look like it really gets used for anything. But it, more often than not, it is used for something. I don't. I think there's really anywhere on the planet left now that we haven't impacted in some way. You know, even if, I mean, now I can actually, we, you can categorically say that we have impacted the whole planet because just the fact that we're responsible for the, the rise in um, global temperatures yeah. means that we've oh, impacted yeah, everywhere yeah, yeah. on the planet yeah, somewhere, no. even if we haven't physically put our hands on it. Yeah. Uh, but you, you bring up um, Europa, and I, I want to pick your brains on this a little bit because I'm actually in the process of <clears throat> writing a piece for Modern Huntsman in the next volume, uh, which is looking at fire as a management tool around the world. I'm going to tie it back to what I know best and the people who I can access here, which is this, what we call muir burn. Uh, but like you rightly pointed out, we've been using fire around the world for hundreds and hundreds of years as a management tool. Even if we didn't fully appreciate all the consequences of it, we were doing it very often for the good of the landscape because we needed that landscape to survive. So what is uh, what is your view on the use of fire here in terms of Muir Burn and its, and its importance? Because it's coming under a lot of criticism now. It I is, mean, there yeah. is, it's not out with the realms of possibility that it might be banned. Yeah, well, <clears throat> it could, it could, well I, I'm, I'm always a believer that anything could be banned at any minute, <laughs> the way things are but, going uh, nowadays. But the point but, is like, it's, it's on the tongues of politicians. Yeah, very, right? very much so. And I think it's, um, and again, a lot of the things related to our uplands is very, it's a very heated, very divisive. There's very, <laughs> <Boom>. <laughs> I <laughs> put out, God, I didn't mean that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's a lot of passion on each side of the, each side of the fence, you know. Um, but certainly the experience that I've had with Mirburn personally, like, don't get me wrong, um, Byron, I, I'm not by any means an expert and I actually don't no, necessarily and, like that word expert because there's a lot and, of people using it. And don't worry, I'm doing a whole podcast on Mirburn <laughs> with uh, yeah. Andrew Gilruth and Owen Williams and a whole other bunch of people. Get so a, get a, this get a, is get a this, keeper this, in yeah, there. So that's, yeah, that'll, that'll be coming after this podcast. Excellent. Um, so yeah, feel free to have like as much of an overview as you like and we Brilliant, can, yeah, I can dig good. in. In fact, you can give me the things to dig into because it's things like, which I don't even think we have the answers to all of this because the science hasn't been done fully is yeah. water quality and flooding and carbon sequestering. Yeah. Like, I don't know if we have all the answers. No, stuff. we don't. And there's a lot of there's a lot of conflicting evidence out there to suggest that, you know, burning is bad, but then at the same time there's a lot of evidence to say that it actually isn't as bad. So um, you know, there's been a lot of stuff and a lot of money being pumped into the research over the years. This is probably the longest standing study on Muir burn is in the Pennines actually, and that's been running for around sixty year. And that's some very interesting findings coming out of that. And actually, a lot of the stuff that the anti-burning, the you know, the that sort of argument, uh, a lot of that that st- long-standing study actually refutes a lot of that. So I think it's um, we just have to be very quite careful in what we're actually trying to achieve here with the with the scientific work because I find I don't know, I'm a big believer of science, Byron, but we can't be just led by. A completely scientific world. We need to have science hand in hand with management going forward for the betterment of everybody. We just can't have science dictating what we're going to do because if we, if we end up doing that, we're going to lose our knowledge from Europe and we're going to lose our knowledge for you know upland hill farming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So from Muirburn, <clears throat> I've been professionally involved with Muirburn in this role for around four years and both in Ireland and, and to some degree in Wales as well. And from certainly what I've seen in Scotland, um, GWCT have been heavily involved with um, uh, revising the Muirburn Code that was launched in September 2017 um, by Rosanna Cunningham. Um, and from my experience the of that... Minister for Scotland. Yeah, sorry, the Environment Minister for Scotland. Um, she... Um, with my experience with that, I think around... 15, 20 years ago, I can't exactly remember when the first Muirburn Code came out. It was actually it was to be a very much a practitioner's guide for Muirburn. The, like a how-to. Exactly, a how-to. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, the Muirburn Code certainly is doing that 
today, but it's actually been very much policy driven. And uh, and don't get me wrong, I'm not I'm not denying the fact that policy is very important. But a Muirburn code is a, in my eyes should be a how to do or how not to do in some instances um, of how people to, to to follow those guidelines. And I think. Um, that referring back to that gentleman in Australia, of the level of confusion amongst folk, and he was saying that um, you know a lot of the bureaucracy, red tape, and the complica- the complicating a lot of these very simple issues is actually being a massive detriment to some of these practices. Um, to give you some examples, you know the traditional um, burning of for grouse moor management is you know you know thirty meters wide and 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 fifty meters long. You know it's traditionally small fires. Yeah. Whereas now you patchwork, tr- yeah, patchwork yeah. effect, yeah, exactly. So it's small controlled areas uh, versus a, a shepherd's fire or, or for deer manager fire would want to be much bigger for 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 reasons of, you know, you don't. It's normally for for grazing. Yeah, great for gra- improved grazing. Exactly, yeah. improved grazing. Yeah, and that tended to happen on lower areas of the hill, not quite the. Yeah, sometimes or the west of the country where or, there's sort or, of more yeah, deer yeah. Or, or, or or more sheep. grasses and less heather. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. and um, and because if you burn with the smaller fires, you'll actually find that what we call the honeypot effect. So if you're going to burn a fire out in the west coast of Scotland and you do load of small little ones, your sheep or your deer are just going to go to those small <laughs> little ones and hammer them. And yeah. basically the regeneration of that young heather coming through is going to be really badly damaged. Yeah, so the, hence them having a bigger, yeah, bigger fire to, to Which, to which does that. tell you that you're getting much improved nutrients from the small fires. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, because yeah. animals aren't stupid. You can't yeah. tell them, oh, by the way, yeah. <laughs> that's where you need to go because that's where the good shit yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they go there because they can... They can smell it and they can yeah. taste it and it's sweeter and it's yeah. fresher. Oh, they know it. Yeah, yeah. They know. They're, they're not stupid. Um, so, but the the traditional fire, um, year burn uh, that I've I've actually been very lucky to to be burning with a number of states up here and and deep side over the last few weeks. Really, we've had. A, Got some good days burning in sort of end of January, early Before February. Before all this came in. Before all the white <laughs> stuff, yeah. <laughs> um, and learning from the expertise from a lot of these practitioners and these keepers, you know, 30, 40 years of experience uh, of burning. And the way they're doing it is 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 very responsibly, very controlled, obviously controlled muir burn. Uh, and you just did the, air quotes there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and having um, the title is called a cool burn. Hmm. So... Um, I was out on a local estate here. It was, it was yeah, it was beginning of February, and um, the the headkeeper of the estate, um, brilliantly experienced man, a very nice gentleman, and he um, he basically fully explained to me and sh- and physically showed me the cool burn. So we burnt a burnt a whatever twenty odd meter wide and a fifty meter strip, and then after the f- the fire was put out, we actually walked back on top of the the area that it was burnt, and you'd literally scrape down to probably five, six centimetres into the soil, even probably sometimes even less. And you'd actually just see, you can see the, the, the not the peat, but the, the, the soil, um, peaty mixed soil. Um, and um, and the um, and then he actually, he, we walked over to, to a nice bunch of sphagnum where the, the fire had ran over, a cool fire. He actually picked up the sphagnum and he, and he drenched it with his hand and a lot of water fell out of it. And, and to me, you know, a layman, pure layman here, that's not causing any damage, you know? Uh, and the big and the big argument now in the burning world is burning on blanket bog, where it's, yeah, of course, it's a very sensitive yeah, because habitat. Because these are, it's a sensitive habitat and also a massive carbon sink. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But but I think there's a misunderstanding is that you're not burning the peat. No, exactly. If you're burning the peat, something has massively gone yeah. wrong. And in fact, yeah. the big wildfires, which we saw just this summer past, those are burning deep down into mm, the peat. Yeah, yeah. And they are certainly the fires that no land manager, no gamekeeper, no, no shepherd ever, ever wants. Because at the end of the day, that soil structure that piece is their canvas to work with yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that is their future exactly that that's, it doesn't make any sense in my mind whatsoever that a gamekeeper or a shepherd is want to damage that because that's basically that's what's producing the young young shoot grow young shoots for either their sheep their deer or their grouse um so um uh, very interesting I've, I've some friends down in northern england in the pennines and england have been going through a very interesting shift in their sort of burn policy obviously because they've had a lot of wildfires down there yeah and even of, more so than us yeah very Saddle much earth. So. yeah and um and the um there's a, a moor down there in the north pennines very interesting the keeper's telling me i go down there counting grouse every every year with some of my irish pals um irish pointer men and um he was basically saying i think around 10 was it 10 roughly around 10 year ago naturally we were saying no 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 
don't go anywhere near a blanket bog. Don't touch it. Can't, you know, burning on top. You can't burn on blanket bog. It's detrimental. Five years ago, the Natural England advisors were actually advising them to burn on blanket bog because they physically saw from a cool fire going over some sphagnum the, the the amazing so you open up the leaf litter you actually let more light into the sphagnum the sphagnum the was under, actually under, that sphagnum was actually it, yeah. getting it was actually growing better oh really you know the, 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 the habitat was improved because again the visor saw it I said bloody hell that, that's actually doing quite good rather than the things you're going to read oh it's always negative when burning on blanket pug and the important thing to remember here Byron is that every single fire is going to be different you know yeah. peat layer moss yeah. layer is it sphagnum? Is it, is it poly? And the day, and the way the wind is as well. In exactly, terms of like it's yeah, burning yeah. in inappropriate conditions. Definitely, too. yeah. And uh, and I was really unfortunate when I was down there um, in roughly around yeah March this Mar- uh, around March last year, and the keepers are telling me now the natural England have gone back on their word and they say that you're not allowed to burn on blanket bog or I think they've changed the goalpost. Not no burning on deep peat. And that's where we're basically at in um, Scotland as well, right now. No, well, not there's, it's not not quite. There's obviously there obviously has to be so much level of caution when burning on deep peat because obviously you know if a fire if a hot, if hot enough fire gets into that peat layer that can burn for days if and not it's weeks. Almost impossible to put out. Exactly, yeah, and that was one of the examples we saw with the Mar- the Marisher wildfire. Um, that was that was very because it got down deep into the peat. Yeah, and just exactly. kept on burning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, that was a wildfire. Um, that was just, a wildfire. Just exactly. Clear. Distinction between the two: controlled <laughs> yeah. and, and wildfire. How was that one? <laughs> I, I was a, I was abroad when that one started. Yeah, I'm so not too probably sure. Probably a barbecue. Yeah, some m- I'm not 100 percent sure to be honest. I think there's been a few reports that it started in forestry, but I, I can't really. I don't really know enough about it. I can, to, I can to look say. it up. Yeah, um, it was stopped by a grouse mine. I know that. It actually yeah. got, it got into an area where there was controlled muir burn, and that's why one of the main reasons why it actually oh, stopped. Oh really? Just yeah, because yeah. of the, the the fuel load breaking? Yeah, broke it, breaking up the, <laughs> with the traditional method. So it's quite ironic. <laughs> yeah, because the thing um, is, if you don't have uh, fire breaks, I mean, we have. And unless I'm wrong, I don't think we have any other system of fire break management in Scotland other than grouse moors. Not really. There will there will obviously be some forestry fire breaks because obviously that's a lot of those uh, are just roads. Though, yeah, roads. roads. Aye, but yeah, but not nothing to the extent. No, certainly, certainly not in the uplands. No, definitely not. No, um, and again, we're all we're all. We we see the importance of um, you know being responsible um, and you know not causing any damage to the environment. Is obviously the environment is getting such a big um, push at the moment from from a whole suite of different things. But and I think like to some extent, well, well actually to the greater extent, I think it's great that it's in the news all the time because yeah, people are wonderful. thinking about exactly it. yeah yeah. It's just that like you brought up earlier, uh, the polarization of opinions. Mm prevents us sometimes moving forward in a positive manner. Yeah, yeah. No, 100%. Uh, but the thing if with, with the, the issue with Muirburn is that it's such a it's it's an art. You know, I've been I've probably been burning for pff, not long at all. Probably around 10 years, you know, I mean, I can't again, I'm not 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 extremely experienced with it, but for, certainly for what I have learned, you know, it's it is an amazing art. You really need to know what you're doing and the knowledge of it in this country in particular is, is wonderful. And then back to the Australian wildfire side, that gentleman said that that knowledge has been lost. We've forgotten it. We've become modern. And I really, I really, I do quite detest that level of ignorance, if you will, you know. Of this. I think they've realised it now in Australia. They're yeah. going back to the... I, they are, yeah. yeah, but I think yeah the, it, the, the, the cultural the, burning, yeah. the, the historical cultural burning, which is yeah. held, that, that knowledge is held by their native population. I don't always associate modern day life as something as actually developed and actually as forward thinking and as positive as a lot of people do. I find that, you know, you, you, you can't understand where you're going to if you don't know where you're from. You know, and it's, I find that's really, really important, especially traditional management techniques like muir burn. Um, you know, because once that knowledge is gone, Byron, that's not coming back. It's like the curly populations in Ireland. Once they're gone... Try and recover them. <laughs> yeah, I think that there's a... The way that it's presented in the media, there's this notion that... It, I think there are some elements that like to portray this, is that it's just a bunch of thugs up on the hills lighting <laughs> fires. Ah, uh, yeah, and it's a very uh, easy it's target. Light a, light a fire. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, which every, is, everybody, uh, every young keeper likes to see things burn. Ah, uh, yeah, pyromaniacs here and there. Yeah, exactly. Uh. Well, that's the perception. Likes, likes to see stuff die and likes to set things on fire. Yeah, yeah. But that's not the truth. No. Like, that's very far from reality. Because no. you're right. It is a... Oh, there is a shitload of knowledge. There's a lot of skill in doing it properly. Yeah, anybody yeah. can light a fire. Ah, of course, yeah. But yeah. to to light a fire, a managed fire, mm. in like the way that you've been describing, you don't just learn that overnight. No, no, it's years and years and years. And um, 
as thought escapes me now what my next point was going to be. No, it's, it's gone. gone. <laughs> it's gone, though. That happens the best, but the, do- the dogs don't care. <laughs> I was thinking of putting a log on that fire. I'm gonna yeah, yeah go, go and put fire. a log on the fire. We need to stay warm. That's important. Yeah, that was the um, point that's just thundered back to me. Okay. Um, me. Oh, hang on. The... Um, Sorry, I work in this technology. <laughs> um, the reasons there's a multitude of reasons why people actually burn a fire. You know, um, for a grouse farm manager, he's trying to produce young shoots and a, a mosaic of habitats for 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 grouse to survive in. So your young short heather, um, um, or your pioneering heather, is some of the official title is used for. You know, it's like a lovely steak dinner dinner to you and I for for, for nutrition reasons for, for or young a grouse. goose burger or a goose burger, <laughs> preferably a goose burger. <laughs> Um, and uh, and then you got your sort of um, mid-range heather, so sort of so pioneering is young, mature is middle, and then you have your ge- degenerate is your sort of third stage. Yeah. Uh, so and that and that and rank that, rank yeah. heather are commonly known. Ah, as. yeah, <laughs> up to your waist deep. Yeah. <laughs> um, and all those different levels of habitat, you know, you're creating these all these little micro habitats for things to survive in. And yeah, they're doing the grouse keeper is doing it for grouse production, but the you know golden plover in particular love that young short heather to nest in, and because I love to see predators coming from here and there. And um, curlew like the sort of um, they can like potentially rank heather as well, but sort of the mature to sort of rank level. Um, and then so it's a whole suite of different reasons why it's burned. But to give you an example, you know, Donside in particular. Um, because um, it would be remiss of me if we didn't mention mountain hares in regards to muir yeah. burn. So you I know, just want to move your mic. Your your impressive beard is cool. uh, <laughs> <laughs> a winter coat. <laughs> <laughs> <Your> winter coat. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, m- mountain hares. Yeah. So yeah, because basically um, the moors over in Donside, the uh, the, the grouse moors there, they have one of the highest, if not the highest, breeding densities of mountain hare in the whole of Europe. Um, That's and crazy. It's, I uh, love mountain hares. They're a beautiful, beautiful species. Um, One of three species that change white in the winter here? Uh, yes. Stoats yeah. and ptarmigan? Stoats, ptarmigan, and. Ma- yeah, it's correct. Yeah. I don't think there's mountain any else. Uh, don't know, actually. Um, I think it would be three. I'm going to check that out. <laughs> Carry on. Sorry. <laughs> I ruined no, your it's train fine. Good tangent. I love a, love a man with a lo- <laughs> lo- passion for tangents. Um, so, yeah, so basically, the, the moors over in Donside. Um, predominantly grouse more management is the number one land management form over there and um, they carry out controlled muir burn every year and have done for the last I don't know 50 plus years um, but the density of mountain hair over there is astronomically high you know I think this year it's quite interestingly from a lot of the, the mountain hair count work that we've been doing um, I'll give you a little bit of a plug on this so GCT yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come back we'll come to, on to that yeah, okay yeah, great yeah. no worries um, basically the you, you burn heather create good habitat nutritious habitat better quality animals bump and they go you know they can skyrocket and there's, the numbers over there are, are fantastic um, so again so you, one, one benefit for grouse is for mountain hair potentially for deer as well for curlew golden plover on the tops, you know, black grouse as well. So there's a whole suite of things that are benefiting here, not just a one species. And again, like the grey partridge of the lowlands, um, you know, as an umbrella species, the grouse, I find the red grouse is certainly an umbrella species for the uplands. You can, and by umbrella species, you mean you can tell what's going on in the landscape by looking at a single species exactly. rather than having to monitor yeah, yeah, all of them. Yeah, a very good barometer, if you yeah. will. Um, and, um, and without that passion and without that value, we find that, um, there isn't the care for the landscape. You know, it's a very good thing that I've listened to on a number of your podcasts about, you know, the You passion. listen to something decent on the podcast, <laughs> really? I don't think anybody listens to this no, shit. No, it's good. No, it's good <laughs> shit, man. It's good shit. Um, but the... Um, the I just ran out of my mind again. <laughs> Little bugger. <laughs> it was something you listened to on podcasts, uh, which oh clearly yeah. wasn't that good. Oh, yeah. No, no, it was. It was um, this, there was um, the, the element of... Um, the importance of hunters in the conservation sector, you know, uh, and the passion for that and the, you know, the caring of it. Because from an outsider looking in, to look after something to kill it is like, why in God's name would you ever do that? Yeah. Friends in Ireland are Intuitively, friends here, it makes no it sense. It does not make any sense whatsoever on paper. Yeah. But the people who don't live in the paper world, yeah. <laughs> you, I, gamekeepers, shepherds, etc., um, see that the, the, the amazing benefits, if there's a value in something, it will be protected and 
cared for. Obviously, if there's a value in something, it can be exploited. But you know, every every inch of human nature can be exploited. You can argue the point. Um, so yeah, it's it's Muirburn is a it's a wonderful tool, but it's one of those tools that we have to do it responsibly. You know, and there's a lot more people looking in on the whole grouse management sector now. Obviously, with the grouse more review. That was undertaken by Professor Alan Werty. Um, yeah. So there is some recommendations in there that we're looking that Muirburn potentially will be become a licensing system. There's been some recommendations in there. Nothing has been set in legislation yet, but potentially a system for um, undertaking Muirburn under like a general license system like we do for corvids. Mm-hmm. It, for, should be, it, should probably, it should probably be, sorry to interrupt you, stressed with regard to Muirburn that it does sit under a, a certain code where there are seasons for burning. It's not just yeah. you can do it whenever the hell you like. Yeah, and yeah. And even if you could do it whenever the hell you like, people who undertake it for management wouldn't want to do it no. at all times of year anyway. No, because no. it would be in that way, it, uh, the wrong time of year, it could be detrimental for what you're trying to achieve. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And there has been some cases in the past where it's been an early year, some cases that I think, oh, bloody hell. My, my grace, for example, or even, or even other birds going down on nests a bit earlier. Yeah. But, but keepers are very in tune to that, so they'll yeah, know when they to stop it, themselves. Of course, yeah. Just to go back to, to mountain hare, because that's, uh, as a species, it's probably as topical as grouse and, and indeed red deer are right now in the discussion in Scotland. What, just explain where the controversy lies with regard to, to white hares, because we see it, I, I guarantee it, so where where are we now? We're in February. I'm surprised I haven't seen it yet this year because normally about February time every year we see something hitting the paper about, and they're, they're normally pictures from like the 1990s or 1980s where there's piles of dead white hares lying and it's Scot- Scottish gamekeepers slaughter the iconic white hare. Um, so where does that where does that come from? What's the reality? What's the truth? What do we know about ha- um, hair on the ground in terms of their population and re- retraction of their population range, and how they fare on like managed moors, like we've been talking about, and non-managed moors? Because I I think there's a lot of misinformation out there on that. Um, for a start, they're freaking awesome. <laughs> Yeah, they are. They also happen to taste quite good. They are absolutely <laughs> delicious. Yeah, we yeah, um, ate one, ate some last weekend from from the mountain that we just um, um, shot them um, a while ago. Beautiful, beautiful meat. Um, beautiful, beautiful animal as well. Um, so yeah, probably one of the most contentious <laughs> um, things in the upland sort of sector at the moment, um, and has been for the last wee while. Um, so basically, the under the um, EU legislation, um, they are uh, designated as a protected species. Um, so now, obviously, there's a closed season for them where you're not able to hunt. Because it never used to be that way. No, it used to be quite open. Yeah, um, and um, um, so so that's been enacted. Um, and but I think it's like a lot of things with European legislation. They've um, just because something is rare in the European continent doesn't necessarily mean it's rare in the UK. Great crested newts, for example, is a good is a good example. Very rare in Europe, but there's absolutely shed tons of them, certainly down in southern England. Oh, okay. So you know, it's one of these things that you're trying to get an overall brush of the whole thing, but yeah. you're actually looking in the finer compartments of these things, and actually they need to be a little bit slightly tweaked. S- tweaked, depending yeah. on local variants. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so um, some of the work that we've been doing on mountain hair recently. Um, well, not recently, I'd say probably one of our best, longest standing studies within the GWCT is what's called our National Game Bag Census, so the NGC for short. And that's been analysing game bags, so returns that estates and, and gamekeepers and, and landowners return to us year on year. Uh, it's an amazing data set that we've had since the 1950s, 60s. So a fantastic data set, and that basically shows the, the number of mountain hares that are, that are culled within a certain estate per year. And, and by that, you can extrapolate population trends? Ye, not exactly, no. Unfortunately, not. So it doesn't actually give exact population indices. It gives numbers taken. Okay. But it can give us... But a you ver- can still take trend data from that. Exactly. Okay. A, a certain trend, yeah. So yeah. basically what we've seen since the 1950s, 60s, is actually um, the the hair population actually fluctuates, as we know, um, due as to, do grass due to numbers. Exactly, as do a lot of populations. So there's usually on that sort of seven to nine year cycle of pigs and troughs. 
And again, if, if folk are more interested in this for more information, there's some some great information on the GWCT website um, of, of this very useful graph of the NGC data. Um, basically showing from that time all the way to present is actually, from our statistical modeling of that, it's actually the population has actually, from that data set, has actually stayed stable. So from the traditional method of shooting a lot, shooting some mountain hare when they see some versus shooting none if they see none was the traditional way of doing it. You know, if you don't see a lot of anything, of course you're not going to want to shoot it. But if you see a lot of it, you might take off a, a certain crop. And um, that coupled with the NGC data, unfortunately, wasn't enough to satisfy SNH's needs for a sort of um, standard or, or um, um, assessing the conservation status of the species. So what we're doing now is, is sort of a, a, a third additional sort of um, thing is doing the, the actual population counting of the species okay and you and because you've been involved a lot of this yeah we've been heavily involved with it so the last we've been running uh, mountain hair count training courses for the last two years now um it's been an amazing success story Um we've i think we've trained up um i think it's around 60 different estates all across scotland and we've probably got up to 150 gamekeepers trained up, gamekeepers and managers, um, not just gamekeepers doing the counts as well as a whole lot of other people doing them. We need to get more people doing them because we need to have a bit of a level playing field of, you know, this isn't shouldn't just be focusing on Greg's management yeah, area. This should be a whole you, picture, you know. I want you to explain exactly how, how you count them, but I was just going to ask you, who else is doing it? Because that's... Uh, Surely it shouldn't just be gamekeepers doing. It. I mean, yeah. it's great that they do, and obviously they're they're employed on a year-round basis. But uh, and and it's I think it's it's important and responsible that they understand their populations. And now we have this new system in place, so now we can hopefully understand the populations even better than we did before uh, on a sort of a, a numbers and a more scientific basis. But who else is doing it? You know, what about the areas that w there are no gamekeepers? Surely it should be the responsibility of other landowners or, you know, whoever that might be. Yeah, well, th definitely. That was a lot of the questions that we um, we got asked at oh, all these you? training courses. I, I didn't like, know that. No, 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 the gamekeepers are asking. off the top of my head. No, so. no, it's good. Oh, yeah. it's pure natural. <laughs> 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 That's good. But again, it's, um, you know, they always ask, why the hell do we just have to do it? You know, it's not fair that one cohort gets targeted and then the other doesn't, but that's a... That's another matter for another day. Um, and it's a very good point. And uh, I think there's some SNH reserves are doing some counts themselves now. Um, but there needs to be more people doing it. You know, there needs to be the Abernethys, there needs to be the Glenfeshies or the southwest of Scotland estates down there where. Where uh, there's not many mountain Where there's sweet and half of mountain hair, you know? <laughs> and maybe actually, they don't need to do the. I mean, they should do the counts, <laughs> or maybe they know that they don't need to because yeah. there's nothing there. Yeah. I mean, is that. This is a, seems like a silly question. Is that a, a coincidence, or is it just that historically you wouldn't have found them so much on the west coast? I mean, they are our they are a native species here. Unlike as we were discussing today, brown hare and rabbits are not yeah, actually native to British Isles. Oh. Yeah, they are, they're they're foreigners. <laughs> Get them out of here. Um, but they are a, a native sp species to this to these islands. Um, is it the case that we just wouldn't have found them on the west coast, or is it that the management system that has been Undertaken for grouse predominantly just happens to be favored by mountain hares. Yeah, well, or is this chicken and egg? Uh, no, well, tr traditionally mountain hares were actually everywhere across the UK. You know, yeah, even actually onto the, now but you're it, jogging my memory. Something that Adam Smith told me. Yeah, even down onto the low ground. Even on the low ground. Yeah, around. exactly. So then yeah. there was the sort of competition. Brown hare being a bigger animal, yeah, they actually kicked them out. So get back it, off, get back it, off to the shit house. Get to the shit house up there. We don't want to eat that stuff up there. This sweet grass down here is better. So I don't know how long that is. Probably the last 100, 200 years, if not more. The the range of mountain hares would have been quite relatively spread out, but you can imagine wet, wet west coast of Scotland yeah. probably wouldn't be the easiest habitat to live Who in. Who wants to be there? I mean, it's beautiful, but... <laughs> oh, it's stunning. I absolutely love it to yeah, bits. But, yeah. you know, for for an animal to survive out there and breed and, and uh, you know, do well in it, it's quite a, a, an unforgiving... Uh, environment especially in the depths of winter um so um but certainly from the the research point of view that we've seen um uh is showing that mountain hares very similar like a lot of waders are doing best on areas managed for driven gray shooting and there's a recent paper that's been um i'm not sure if it's been published or it's certainly in the pipe work um by my colleague dr nick hesford who's actually looking at the distinctions between non-managed ground versus walked up grouse shooting and then driven grouse shooting. Okay. 
uh, and they're showing that there is a very clear distinction between hair densities on driven grouse shooting moors due to um, increased level of um, investment, increased level of keepering, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, versus just the walked up ground. Um, so it's a very interesting dynamic that we're seeing. But I think it's a uh, through the media and through all the the guff that we're being fed through our guff. It's such a great. <laughs> I think it's a Scottish word. That that's it's a great that's Scottish that's word. Guff. guff. <laughs> um, right the way through all the media that we've been we've been spoon fed over the last few months, if not years, about mountain hares. Um, is that um, you know what was that scientific Paper the the media going up mountain hairs reduced to one yeah, percent level of the nineteen fifties. But, but that paper it's just uh, ridiculous. was kept on being resubmitted because no one wanted to peer review it. Ah, I think <laughs> it was resubmitted over the space of like three or four years, yeah, multiple it was, times. It's insane. Could give you an example of that paper. Um, you know the gentleman um, n- names not be need be mentioned because <laughs> everybody knows the, knows him. Um, he did a, a count on Morven, the hill behind my house here, and he counted seven mountain hair. And we did a new methodology in which we've been training up keepers over the last two years. And we counted 209, <laughs> you know. But he counted in the middle of the day from a lay-by with his binoculars. Yeah, I was about to say, I heard he didn't leave the vehicle. No, no. Whereas, I mean, whereas we did it at night with spotlights. So That you know. is only hearsay. I'm yeah. just, I don't want to be sued. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, just explain the methodology. So now, so, now you have a, a scientific method. Yeah for counting hair, which yeah. is going to hopefully actually give us a proper handle on what our population is. Yeah, exactly. And again, uh, for evidence-based uh, management action, because at the end of the day, it's the exact same situation that happened with the deer 15, 20 years ago. We're saying, oh, what the bloody hell am I counting deer for? That's ridiculous. Whereas now it's an industry yeah. standard. Everyone counts exactly. every year. Yeah, yeah. So we're getting this, this, this change of thinking. And actually the, the uptake for the mountain hair <laughs> counting um, by owner has been absolutely fantastic. It was even that speaking shows to fantastic response. It's wonderful. And again, do another thing, another great thing that the gamekeepers are doing there to be on the front, the true front lines of conservation in my eyes. And very interestingly, when we had a training course over in Space, I've had an old crusty old gym of a keeper, <laughs> <laughs> which I never... Like a proper th- grumpy old a, man. A proper style. old school boy. Like, <laughs> yeah. And I thought I'd never see him out of some of that. And he was even there. Yeah. And that just goes to show how much these guys want to show how many hairs they have on the ground and why they need to control them. You know, there is a necessity. They do cause damage to, yeah, yeah, that's to triple SIs and to, to juniper bed in okay, particular. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Uh, grazing, if there is a number in special... And that's a responsibility, right? Triple SI... Special site of scientific incest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it right. Yeah, um, they have a responsibility under the governance of Scottish Natural Heritage yeah. to protect those areas. Yeah, from yeah. all forms of grazing. Yeah, and S and H give out um, a number of licenses every year for. Uh, land managers to control hares in triple SIs and sometimes even out with season licenses, you know, again. Because the because that ecosystem is important for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. And if you're getting a, a, a grazing animal, regardless of being a mountain hare, a rabbit, a sheep or a deer, they're still going to eat like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And if you're going to have something at such a high level, you talk about Donside as a perfect example, there's two more over there that I know they get licenses to, to, to control uh, mountain hair. Fully, yeah, I've seen f- the areas, Fully actually. known to, to S&H yeah, yeah. about it all, and they do it for, for habitat management reasons. Um, yeah, and a lot and, of it is um, the, those juniper spreads. Yeah, 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 but you're having such a volume of hares because they do excellently well that they're literally they're actually so in the Almost a victim of their own success. Exactly, yeah. But yeah. I would, I, I mean, some people will say, well, um, maybe that's the problem. If, the ha- if the habitat was sort of left to be as it would be without the hand of man, yeah. then you'd have low densities of all these things. But uh, which, I mean, uh, you could, we could, you know, we could debate that for an hour. Uh, but one of the things that I'm always keen to point out is that I think we have a responsibility in the age that we live in with increasing human populations and encroachment and uh, the impact and stress on the environment just through people's mouths that need to be fed to try and find a way to harness the environment around us in the most sympathetic way possible. But that includes maximizing our ability to use the resource, but you re- use it in a sustainable manner a responsible and, manner, and, yeah. and responsible manner. Yeah. And in a way that we've been responsible for degradation in the past, use it in a, ma- in a manner that allows us to sort of restore it and naturalize it. And if that means that we can take a harvestable surplus of you know, whatever species that might be, whether that be mountain hare, whether that be red grouse, whether that be deer. I think that's the most environmentally responsible thing that we could do. Yeah, no, no, that's amazing. And the meat... That's better than cattle. Yeah, ah, exactly. And the meat and the 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 social element too and the, com- the community involvement, yeah. you know, is, is amazing. Yeah. And I think it's forgotten. 
very, very much so. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, we have a responsibility to, and I know that some people don't like the idea of using wildlife. Yeah, but we are wildlife too. <laughs> yeah, you know, and wildlife uses wildlife. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, it's a very good point. Um, so yeah, so the the <clears throat> back to the mountain hare um, work that we've been doing. So the the methodology was um, basically um, work that's come from Dr. Scott Newey and uh, Dr. Kathy Fletcher. Um, Dr. Kathy Fletcher is one of our uh, Upland uh, scientists here at the GWCT, uh, who's worked on mountain hare for many many moons. Um, so basically, they were were figuring out for a number of years um, the best ways of the trial out like, so, some capture re- capture recapture models and a whole different suite of best ways to count mountain hare. And so they basically um, uh, came up with a, a, a standardized methodology, um, which was agreed by um, a number of different scientific organizations, both the James Hutton Institute, which Scott Newey works for, and then the GWCT, obviously us. Um, and then that report was given to SNH report i can't f- remember the pr- name of the report but you can look it up online on I'll, look it up. I'll put website. links as well yeah um basically showing the the correct um, method and the standardized method so basically get everybody doing the same thing yeah time if time you don't again. have a standardized exactly. method yeah you, you don't know can't what you're compare doing. <laughs> exactly it's like apples and uh, yeah, yeah yeah so the um so the basically the the the, the method now is um um walking um there's uh, a four kilometer square block and you're walking, um, uh, you do this four transects um, long, and each each length of those transects is two, is two kilometers. So essentially you're walking four kilometers, uh, eight kilometers in, in length of a transect. So to give you an example up on Morven here, we did the count with the with the keepers there two years ago, and what we did we um, were dropped up to the top of the hill. Um, we drove around the back of the hill, m- ensuring not to disturb the count area. Dropped off, and four of us um, dropped off in, in in intervals of between two hundred and fifty and four hundred meters apart. So you're obviously not your count not counting um, double the amount of hairs. So we all got into a line, and then we all walked downhill in a one together, and that's with four four people. And this is during the day. During the dur- sorry, during the night time with, nighttime. with spotlights. Yeah, because okay. basically mountain hares are more active at night. You never see them in the day. It's one of the big problems why people say, "Oh, what you, you've killed all the mountain hares because they're not seeing them yeah, during the day." So but well, they, yeah, they ain't there night. during the day. <laughs> they're, uh, they're they're hiding. They're active in the night, um, eating and 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 and, and whatnot. Um, so basically, we did that. Um, those four transits with four people walking two k. So that's eight kilometers. Sorry, I'm an absolute <laughs> dunce when it comes to numbers. Um, and walking all downhill. And that key element is walking from uphill downhill. Because basically, when you bump a mountain hare, as I'm sure you've seen, they always run uphill, away from danger, sort of thing. Um, so and basically, you do that count. You do that count twice. So you do the counting period is from usually from September till maybe December, um, preferably when there's no snow, <laughs> when it's easier to access the ground. So you do, say, for example, we did that count in September, I think, uh, and then we did another count in November. So basically you're doing two counts to couple it, and that's basically for statistical purposes. The more counts you do, the more accurate your data, pretty much. And do you um, average those out? Uh, yeah, yeah we, we basically, and from that data, so... We counted um, 209 mountain hair on that first count in September. And then what we extract from that is a thing called an encounter rate. So basically we divide the total amount of hairs seen by the total amount length of the transect. So 8 divided by 209, which I've been <laughs> doing my... Uh, so 26. So, so, tw- so 26. So this is a very basic way of, of looking at it. There's a few different... Um, calculation factors because obviously if you're doing one count and two count you try and get your average so from that level of count you get your encounter rate that encounter rate should basically be able to you should be able to extrapolate that out eventually over time is sort of hairs per kilometer squared but we're not there yet so basically we need a data set of maybe five starting point would probably be five we'd probably need a data set of 10 to get really accurate um analysis of it because you know what it's like year on year it's going to be different yeah, and yeah. by the and time yeah, yeah exactly um and basically that encounter rate is going to um give you a good indication if you have a low medium or high population of hairs and we don't know that yet we don't know if is 26 hairs in that count area um yeah, how does that compare sorry is that um 26 hairs per square kilometer sort of in that area a high 
a low or a medium. But to give you an example, our average for Scotland from all the counting data that we've got so far is is averaging at around 15, 15 to 18 hairs. So potentially that is quite count. high. Yeah, potentially quite high. We've actually had higher. Okay. Um, I think we've had one count with 230 odd hairs in it. Um, and basically um, that's giving a very good indication of basically saying, okay, we have quite a few hairs on the ground. We can just extrapolate that out, that out per estate and then we can actually feed that into a management plan yeah. and okay right if i have x amount of hairs on the ground like with the deer i can act i can uh, call x x amount yeah. uh, and we're not there yet there's a lot of questions of saying all right will s and h come and say to me oh i need to i need to ease off of my color and they need to do more because we don't know that yet yeah, it's okay. all new work it's quite it's exciting work it it's is exciting. It's pioneering work yeah. it's interesting because i i think you what you pointed out earlier is that it is it is so important that this is done in the same way as it has become standard practice to count deer. Because the discussion that we're having with deer now is com the complete counter discussion to the one that we're having with, with mountain hare. Yeah, yeah. And yet they are basically a small deer. <laughs> I mean, they're not. Don't get me wrong. I understand the variation <laughs> yeah, of species yeah. no, here. No, no, I'm, but, a, I'm but all for it. They're eating very, they're, yeah. they're, their eating habits are they're quite, quite similar. Animal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. okay. So they're impacting, um, they're e impacting the habitat that they live in in a fairly similar way. Yeah. And yet with one regard, we're saying, you can't touch him. Yeah, yeah. No, and the other one was saying, let's slaughter half the population. Wholesale slaughter. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's 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 diabolical. I think it's... it's, I, it's I'm, one, I've just been, I've been guilty here of doing the 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 red top headline <laughs> slaughter. I, I, I've just done a whole podcast <laughs> talking about the whole deer review. So yeah. I realize that it's not quite as simple as that. <laughs> yeah, but... It, um, it, but, it, but, it, but they're saying it is more than acceptable being encouraged to reduce yeah. uh, deer densities largely on the back of regeneration of trees and yeah, that's yeah. A, a lot of the incentive behind that yeah uh, but hairs will hit yeah. trees too no very much Big so time. yeah and it's it's such a crying shame because you know um the red deer in scotland is one of the most iconic species you can get but yeah. they are just absolutely some cases treated like absolute like dirt pests. and it's and, yeah. and it's I, in my eyes it's not it's not right and again even you'll have some wildlife charities you know John Muir Trust have been in the news over a lot of many of cases of you know shooting beasts and you know leaving, leaving them in the hill, hill et cetera et cetera all that type of things and you know animal welfare standards needs to be the same for all not just for chick pick and choose your species yeah. you know um, there's a lot of nuances to it that I think people don't understand uh, mainly because it is quite complicated and it's very easy to yeah. grab headlines yeah, yeah. with a small number of species but it's yeah or it's a, cute, a, a cute cuddly species yeah, like it is. Mountain, yeah but it's a very complex web of interactions yeah. between species and habitat Aye. yeah yeah but we should we should listen to what's already been happening to the mountain hare range contraction they've been lost in large tracts of ground in scotland in the southwest and you know people will bang on about keepers culling them um, on you know on the traditional big old drives that they used to do and shoot whatever hundreds in a day or whatever in the 1950s and 60s but you should look at a lot more um, pressing matters like afforestation and, mm -hmm. and the level of predation they won't live in forests mm, they'll live at certain forests from the sort of the uh, before the canopy closes over mm. they, they will they will to a certain degree but, but they, not won't, they not, won't thrive but not the big block Sitka spruce no god no, uh, no, no. I mean, nothing fucking lives in those <laughs> <Aye>. <laughs> basically nothing lives Aye. in those um, so we just um, but it, it, it's, it's fascinating work and it's something that it's that GWCT has really been a has taken a lead on, yeah, uh, it's, and, it's, it, and it's been really good. And it's 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 part of the work that I really enjoy um, is basically bridging the gap between you know the the sporting, hunting, shooting, fishing world and the you know the the environmentalist conservation or government world and policy. You know there yeah. needs to be which and they need to the be knitted ground. closer together. Definitely, as well, yeah. Because yeah. I think what I think even actually a lot of gamekeepers probably don't realise quite the conservationists that they are. I think there's an increasing realization of it because it's becoming important to explain that role um, for people to sort of buy into to gamekeeping in a more positive light, if that's at all possible. But the other thing that I, I actually wrote an article about it uh, some months back is that as a community, and this is a great example of the hair counting, is we're involved in a lot of citizen science. Mm, yeah, fantastic amount. Yeah. And all free. Yeah. <laughs> There's not one single penny has gone to any of these keepers for this. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic story to tell. Mm. Um, what, um, I think the first time I ever met you was 
doing bird transect surveys. Mm, yeah, what, so that was it's a similar idea to the yeah similar idea. Yeah, so we were we were this was God, it was probably three years ago now. I think probably it was, was yeah, yeah, uh, down up in Glen uh, yeah Glen Lethen, yeah in the Angus Glens, beautiful spot. Um, so that was pretty much training up gamekeepers to um, count waders on the ground, and that was in the light of trying to get adaptive management licenses and this was the particular aim to try and get raven control uh, enacted okay. in some of these areas to try and protect these ground nesting birds because uh, I know certainly in your part of the world you've got big big flocks of, of big raven, ju juvenile, juvenile ravens, ravens yeah, yeah. doing quite a lot of damage um, and basically training up gamekeepers to count their waders very similar to the hares you know know what you have on your ground so the plan was to count the uh, count the waders three times in the year. So one count in April at li uh, along a transect. So either a two thousand meter long transect is usually the the common one, and um, between six a.m. and seven a.m. in the morning. So again, standardised sort of counting methodology from GWCT's um, um, experience over the years doing this this work. Um, so you do one count in April. One count in mid May ish, beginning of May, maybe mid May, and then one uh, no later than the first week in June. And that third count gives you a really good indication of productivity for your wading chicks. So your your lapwing, your oystercatcher, your snipe. Obviously, difficult to see snipe because they're very secretive. <laughs> they are, <laughs> and very curly as well. They're right little buggers to yeah, try and see. Even yeah, though they're actually yeah, quite a big bird, massive bird, but yeah, yeah they're they're ama amazing, amazing animals just to to, to evade. You try and find one sitting on a nest. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, no, they're wonderful birds. Uh, and basically, so doing three. Waiter, three transit counts a year for the waiters and then doing a coordinated raven count so again counting your numbers knowing what you have and then feeding that into a license application to potentially take out X amount of, of ravens because again for protection of waiters protection of ground nesting birds because what, what we're finding now is that you're having for a stock license to control ravens you can get it a drop of a hat and stock license, you mean for like for sheep and for lambing parks? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that is very easy to do. You know, phone call or even a letter, and you're sort of there, and you get I don't know, varies from state to state or farm to farm, but it's very relatively very easy process. Whereas what we found in Strathbran over in Perthshire, the big hoo ha that we went on last year, and um, behind it all, is that the amount of um, work that we had to do for a red listed species was crazy. You know, we the we had to do all the the waiter counts. We had to do the raven counts. We had to do um, potentially nest camera work. And and don't get me wrong, Byron, we need all this information, and that's key. But we're getting to such a critical point now. Is it's that like almost a tipping point? Exactly. Some of these time species. is time is not on our side, and time is certainly not on waiter's side, because <laughs> we live here in in, in Ochnairn Farm at D side. And we're absolutely stuffed with lapping. And like Northern England is absolutely stuffed with curry. And I think surely they're not in a decline. But you go anywhere else, you know, south of Birmingham, you know, go to Ireland, you don't hear anything. And that um, certainly with a beautiful haunting call of the curlew. Yeah. So we just we the must call must of not the curlew hear them. is quiet. <laughs> yeah. And and trying to get that way of thinking changed within S and H, um, and 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 not just S and H, you know, Scottish government and the public as well. You know, yeah. people need to know that these animals really need a helping hand here, and they don't need more fighting amongst <laughs> conservation organisations yeah. just to say who's wrong or who's right. It's crazy that that's not an easy discussion to have, um, especially amongst. Um, organizations with a focus on birds. Yeah. I realize that it means that, I and mean, it's like the debate that we were having earlier about controlling one species to help another. Yeah, yeah. But the reason for their decline is largely at our hands anyway. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so and it's it's such a crying shame because the, the Strathbrown license was. was is that well, how long did that exist for one uh, that, year? No, well, we well, it was three years worth of work. So, Adam Smith, my box, boss at uh, GWCD Scotland, um, or my old boss, should I say, um, he began that work in 2016, just when I started. 2017, um, is when I, I probably saw you at the Angus Glens. Um, we did a year's worth of counting then, we didn't have enough counts, so we had to do a second year of counts. So, we increased the number of transects, we doubled the amount of transects that we had. So 2018, we were granted it. But then, if you remember correctly, 2018, the the public flack, Packham, death threats. The oh, yeah. Like, of, oh, it just, was oh, shit hit the fan. And this unreal. was, just to be, be clear for people listening, This, the issue was that uh, people, uh, including these high-profile high, high profile individuals, didn't like the notion of killing a no. small num fairly, fairly small number of ravens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, over the grand to, scheme to, of things, it was... Yeah. red listed species. I know it's just it's just <laughs> it's just bonkers. But on the grand scheme of things, you know the the the, the study the, the the project area. So it wasn't a state by state. It was a it was a massive. It was twenty thousand um, 
is twenty thousand hectares in size. Yeah, so it was it covered pretty, loads of it, farms. It, yeah, loads yeah. of farms, loads of loads of estates, and it was it was absolutely fantastic. And it was a community led approach. And this is what SNH and community buy-in. It was, every, buy it was definitely them. yeah, hundred yeah, percent. And it was wonderful. The farming community and the and the gamekeeping community were amazing there. And again, not a single penny. They were all doing this off the sweat of their own brow. Their busiest time of year spring when their predator control needs to be the best for 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 their wild bird protection um but unfortunately public um public flack the pressure that um chris packham um and a number of other people um instigated on it was was criminal you know the, the i saw these guys uh, i think it was at reviver some some organization w was um selling beanie hats and and it's hoodies wild justice, uh, yeah saying uh, justice for ravens and i'm saying like what about justice for curly? Yeah, exactly, a curly, a red listed species that is going extinct, guys, and has gone locally extinct in many tracts of Scotland and in the UK, needs our help. We don't, need, you know, and and a raven, and again back to this conservation status of a species, the ravens have never been higher population wise. And don't get me wrong, there's some local varial yeah. variances all and across the country. Historically, they were like, I mean, they were decimated yeah. oh, historically, yeah. largely through widespread poisoning across farms yeah. all over the entire country. Yeah, yeah, but that has that, is that has changed, changed yeah, and, and their population has come back. That is now legal yeah. and their population is thriving. Now. And the important distinction between that is actually we were controlling juvenile ravens who were not usually do, not breeding pairs. So we weren't affecting the breeding status of those pairs in that those areas. Yeah. We were finding that the big damage is done by that big juvenile pack. Yeah, because they're, they're mob. They're, like, exactly. they're the thugs of the yeah. sky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, they all but, need asbos. Uh, yeah, yeah. But in all fairness, you know, they, uh, 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 my mum has always taught me in Ireland that everything has a reason. You know, our, the ravens are our vultures, essentially, yeah, yeah, to a certain degree. Obviously, they but, have a place. Yeah. But it's the level of populations that reach so high now. You know, corvids and foxes in particular, they're getting to such a high level. You're finding now in Ireland... He's making you know, a triangle. With making his a ads, triangle. By the way. Do you know the, do you know the trophic <laughs> levels, right? You know, yep. obviously, your predators at the top and your prey at the bottom. In Ireland now, it's completely flipped on its head, and I'd probably argue in the same point down in uh, southwest Scotland. So you have so many predators now, and you have actually sweet naff all prey, and they're and the, and they're getting to a level that they're falling what we call into this predator trap. They they're getting to such a low population that they can never they can never um, increase again. But eventually, that triangle collapses. Yep, and that is the day which I hope we don't see in Scotland, but that is the day that Ireland is juggernauting towards and parts of Scotland as well. And we've, uh, and I'm going to get towards r uh, wrapping up. I just want you to give a little bit about your, your background history, which we've kind of completely skipped over. <laughs> but um, as a way just to feed into that, and we were talking about when we were driving around, is that we don't have to look too far to see what happens if we remove uh, the the power of humans mm. from men and women on yeah. the landscape with regard to management because mm. we can look over the water to um, Ireland we can yeah. look down to Wales yeah what do you see if you look there I mean you're Irish that's, <laughs> that's your country I'm yeah. talking about but it's it's with with one or two very small exceptions, it's a pretty sad state of affairs with regard to wildlife management it is very 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 much so Byron and it's um it's is differences in culture. So in Ireland, we we had land reform a hundred years ago, and this is the direction of travel that Scotland wants to go in. And I'm not saying that Scotland's going to end up like Ireland. Yeah, Scotland is Scotland, and Ireland is Ireland. But you just have to be very careful to w want to wish something so bad that you actually don't think about what other things are going to be going on. Perfect point in case you know what I mean. Ireland lost. We lost our mainstay of our gamekeeping culture you know 50 to 100 year ago probably 50 60 year ago more likely and um, because the you know the estates got broken up they got burnt out by the irish paddies they didn't want the, the english lairds in there anymore etc <laughs> etc et the whole story yep, there you yep, know, yep. Uh, know and then the pri and then the pri and you guys have had it over here the highland clearances and blah 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 and and um with the smp now the political gain of wanting to go after the big landowner etc but without without the big landowner there's no private investment there's no employment and i it's it's i'm i'm so torn in my in my heart is republican through and through you know patriot to ireland you know the tricolor chucky arla the whole nine yards you know what i mean Excellent. all of that but my head and my professional capacity is saying that we need we need the laird. We need the gamekeeper. We need the shepherd. But we that's need the, the private scientist money, you, right? Yeah, the science. Exactly. Well, that's the it's the realist in me, um, Byron. From seeing, from working in Ireland, from working down in Wales. We were working in in, in North Wales, trying to revive grace down there. How did that go? Um, difficult. 
tick is a massive issue down there oh, okay. and um, very similar to Ireland the lairds down there and the lairds in Ireland there's a massive expectancy that some other bu- bugger is going to pay for it mm-hmm. whereas you know too well you know to get results it requires deep deep pockets yeah um, and that, as, that I mean that is really key to much of this discussion is mm. who does pay for it if the private individual doesn't pay for it and I know in exactly. other parts of the world they have mechanisms mm. in place through legislation and taxation mm. that funnels money into conservation initiatives. Yeah. We are always scrapping for money here. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. Uh, we're, we're, we're so stretched, like, you know, it's S&H are stretched, GBCT is stretched, you know. Um, like it's it, Things are becoming, becoming more and more difficult to, A, turn a book or even just uh, continue uh, going going as you, as you normally do. But um, I think certainly for, for bang for book, a, a very strong mantra of GWCTs is conservation through wise use. So that basically means of supporting um, the private landowner, supporting the the gamekeeper, supporting the the, the the folk that are essentially doing all this conservation work for free, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's, and it is, and it, and I, and I personally find from seeing my life in Ireland, my life in Wales, and now laterally here in Scotland, you know, um, with without that, without that money, um, without that passion, uh, I honestly don't think. You guys would have much wildlife in this country if it wasn't for and and um, David Bellamy, Bellamy had a, a, oh, yeah, had a quote, sadly passed God, away. Now. God love his soul. Yeah, had an amazing quote that um, you know this would be um, what was it be a prairie UK would be a prairie landscape without people who hunt, shoot, and fish, and it's so 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 true. And we need to um, we need to do better. But well, at the same time, on the on the, on the uh, sporting side of things, you know, and the, the the game sector, if you will, we need to communicate better. We need to work better on both sides of the fence, and everybody needs to do it. It's not and just always one be striving side. to do a better. Exactly, job. yeah, no, hundred percent, and it's um, it's because uh, like our, our our future is bloody challenging enough as it is with climate change and with you know, I mean, budgets being slashed all the time, et cetera, et cetera. And um, but we just have to learn to build up levels of trust because without trust, we ain't going nowhere. And just the. the uh, that is a, that would would have been a beautiful way to finish it, but I <laughs> I, I never even asked you this when we were driving around earlier. So I, I'm I'm eager to just understand, uh, and you can keep it as brief as you like. Where you're, one of the th- let me just pause for a moment. One of the <laughs> things that really struck me the first time I met you was I don't know. I, I, all I knew is that you worked for the GWCT. <laughs> um, and that you were telling people how to do these surveys. Yeah, was your very very clear passion and love for wildlife and anybody that i've met who also knows you has, has said the same sort of thing so that it it sort of exudes from you like it's <laughs> Is that very mad very irish obvious. nutter who just loves loves the birds that's normally the second <laughs> thing that comes the mad irish nutter. um uh, where did that come from for you like what is your what is your kind of back story with regard to that um, where did so, you get the love well the love I was very very fortunate in my young life um, to have both a mother and a father hence the name Merlin is definitely not the magician I do sweet <laughs> well, oh, me, a magic setup I've got that what all an, my life what an amazing little bird by the <laughs> yeah, way and yeah exactly so that was which uh, also does very well at managed grass yeah it does exactly yeah. Well, wonderfully well and uh, I was named after the bird of prey and my mum and my father were very much involved with bogland conservation in Ireland um, about well, thirty odd years sense, ago. Yeah. yeah, so um, so were they, is, they ecologists or scientists? Uh, or? No, my mum was just very passionate about it. She's just been a she's always uh, Mother Nature has her God sort of thing, uh, and but she uh, she loves Mother Nature, but she just feels again common sense, and she she knows that there is a need for management in every single situation that we live in in these islands. But then the biggest foundation really for me um, was my father. He, he was a gamekeeper for probably around 15, 20 years. Started off his career in the Queen's Royal Hunting Estate over in Holland and uh, Hetlow. Uh, and he worked on a variety of different estates in Ireland. And really from a very, very young age, um, I just loved everything wildlife and especially hunting, shooting and fishing. Um, and it's just as you say over in Ireland with the hurling and the Gaelic football you just can't bait the passion <laughs> <laughs> and it's either you got it or you don't and um, yeah. and just through the years my dad's love of wildlife and it's not just about taking a life you know it's that connection you've talked about it on a number of your your podcasts which again were absolutely fantastic highlighting this connection between our natural world where we come from what we eat is massively important you know 80, 90% of my freezer, 95% of my freezer is game, as I'm sure yeah, yours is. Yeah, high five, you know? mine too. Which is, which is amazing. And again, getting more and more people to eat it is really, really important. Um, 
but just it just it's just a, it's just something that's been in me for many many moons bar and i feel myself extremely lucky to work with so many different amazing people in this country in particular uh, and i've been lucky enough to work with some amazing head keepers that have been you know They've been around the block for 50, 60 years and just being in their presence, you know yourself when you meet an old oh, boy, yeah. you know, and the stuff you pick off there and you, and you, you can't teach that, you know, no. and that's that one-to-one or it's that human connection between people who have the likewise, uh, like-minded mm. passion and they're able to pass that on for, for, for it to be continued. Yeah. It's uh, so important. That, like, I'm a massive advocate for, the sci- for understanding the science behind yeah. things. No, definitely. But, but the there, hand, are things, yeah, the, there are things that are learnt on the ground from those those people who have lived and breathed in, yeah. in, the, in the hills and, no, and in the valleys and on the rivers, yeah, yeah, which they will never view as science. No, no, no. They just know it That's because they've seen life. it and they've known yeah. it. Yeah, and it's their uh-huh. way of life and it might have even been handed down to them. Yeah, yeah. And that knowledge is so easily lost. Yeah, yeah. And that's part of, part of our own connection to this world is to keep that going strong, you know. For me to pass that on to my son, Jura, God love him, little legend of a man. <laughs> what a uh, great name. <laughs> and, um, you know, and likewise for you and your family, your future family and all that thing. And keep that going and it, keep the connection going. Because if we lose it, that's not coming back. Like. And I think it's, um, that's something that should be, should be celebrated and, and, and really, really loved, you know. Mm. Merlin, it has been a, an awesome conversation today. Thank you so much for taking time out. Absolute pleasure. Uh, Thank you for making I, the trip up. Oh, I hope I can get home now. It, it has it, it has snowed <laughs> quite big snowflakes uh, constantly right. since I arrived and throughout the whole podcast. So right. uh, I better get packed up and try and make my way back. Wonderful. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Barn. Good hunting and good shooting and fishing. Thank you. You too. Cheers, buddy.